All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, it's good to see so many of you all on this call. Thank you, ARDC, for inviting me to talk a bit about AAF and ORCID and the things that we do. So, for those of you all who don't know, my name's Melroy, work at the AAF. One of the things that I look after at the AAF is uh, the Australian ORCID Consortium. And some of the other things I'm working on is looking at linkages between persistent identifiers like ORCIDs, DOIs, uh, some of the things that Natasha and Siobhan have mentioned in their presentation, so I'll get to that. But at the AEF, what AEF actually does is it enables seamless identity and access for the Australian research and education sector. So. For those of you all who at any point in time have accessed various resources like uh, publications or data sets or even uh, research infrastructure services like CloudStore using your institutional username or password, effectively you're using a federated identity or you're using a, a it's possible by, because of the Australian Access Federation or the Federation in general. Now, uh, why would you want to use an identity federation, right? Why exactly is it needed? So researchers need access to uh, data, they need access to infrastructure, they need access to funding. Organizations on the other hand want to ensure that they know researchers what sort of resources researchers are accessing? Are they accessing certain publications? Are they accessing certain facilities? And uh, the idea behind that is so that then they can get a much better idea about whether to invest more in keeping those facilities. If enough use isn't being seen, then could they move that investment onto something else that is seeing greater use? So what the Identity Federation needs does is that it enables a more interconnected, efficient and secure uh, research and education system for Australia, but also it helps researchers, teachers and uh, students to collaborate with their peers. So they can be a uh, national collaboration. So between uh, universities in Australia, it could be international collaborations, universities, or organizations abroad, uh, industry partners, and even the government. Uh, it also allows researchers to deliver world-class research outcomes because uh, with the Federation, what it does is it provides researchers with access to world-class research infrastructures. Then uh, there is access as in the trust and identity framework used by the Federation uh, allows them to uh, meet their research needs. Uh, they can use just one username and password. And what they focus on mostly is working on their research, not the IT side of things or the administrative side of things, which is what is important to them. So and why do you need the Identity Federation? Because uh, you want to provide your researchers with secure access to research. If you think of data as the new oil, uh, user accounts get access to systems and system access provides uh, access to the data. But uh, cyber criminals want uh, access to user accounts. Now, if you're using one username and password, which is uh, secure, which is trusted, uh, your institution has given it to you after verifying uh, your identity, it means that it's uh, highly assured and quite secure. So what that means is you do then have uh, secure access to research infrastructure. So, and how does the Australian Federation help? Uh, what it does is, uh, as I mentioned, it allows uh, researchers to use their institutional username and password, and they can access shared resources and services nationally as well as internationally and they don't have to remember multiple usernames or multiple passwords, right? And the AEF also has uh, over 100 organizations that are members of the AEF. So this includes all your Australian universities, CSIRO, New South Wales Health, 
Uh, we've got some medical research institutes as well as the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences. And uh, we also have 300 services that are part of the Federation, which means, uh, and there's also global collaborations to over 270 uh, plus international research services that, uh, that happens through Educain, which is another service that the AEF provides. So that brings me to ORCID. As Natasha mentioned uh, about persistent identifiers, ORCID is a persistent identifier for researchers. It's unique, it's persistent, it's community driven, and it's a not for profit. Uh, and ORCID stands for Open Researcher and Contributor ID. What that means is it allows for researchers to disam disambiguate themselves. So, name disambiguation in research is quite hard and was quite hard before ORCID because you could have a lot of John Smiths, but you wouldn't know which John Smith to cite as part of your paper, especially if you had three or four of them working in the same field. What an ORCID ID does is because it would be unique for each John Smith, you would then be able to attribute and cite their work correctly. And ORCID's vision is that they think there should be a world where everyone who participates in research or any sort of scholarship activity, uh, they need to be connected to their contributions across time, across discipline, as well as uh, borders. So it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that just because you work at one university and then you decide to change organizations, you lose access, you lose. Uh, whatever you've done previously or because you decide you want to change your name doesn't mean that everything you've done under your former name, uh, you lose access to that or you no longer get attributed for it because research is an ongoing thing. It's continuous development and you should be able to get, uh, you should be able to be recognized for all your contributions that you've made. Now, about the Australian Orchid Consortium, it is a national orchid community. It was launched in 2016. What you see over here is the timeline from when it was launched to about 2021. In 2016, at the end of 2016, 52% of our members had integrated with Orchid. At the end of 2020, it's now 83% of our members have integrated. And uh, the consortium started off with 40 members and at in 2020, at the end of 2020 and even in 2021, we've got 42 members now who are Australian Orchid Consortium members. Right, so since the launch of the consortium, Australian Orchid IDs have been constantly increasing, as you can see from this graph. At this stage, uh, as of 1st January 2021, more than 152,000 ORCID IDs were registered to Australian email addresses. But importantly, also 83% of our consortium members have integrated with ORCID. And it's quite, uh, quite varied in terms of the integration. So about 18 of it have been custom or bespoke integrations. 27 of them have gone with a vendor of some sort. And we've got 35 members who've done an ORCID integration, but there are 45 total integrations, which means that some members have done multiple ORCID integrations. Oh, so how do you enable seamless authentication and uh, track all this scholarly research and the contributions that researchers make? Uh, you start off with, you get researchers to sign in using their institutional credentials, put in their username, put in their password, log in, they get access to that resource, right? But more importantly, as an organization, you need to do an ORCID integration. You need to be able to collect authenticated ORCID IDs. Once you've done that, what you'd want to do is advertise these collected and authenticated ORCID IDs as an attribute to the Federation. Now, within the Federation, what we have is we have an attribute that is specific to ORCID. It's called EduPerson ORCID attribute. And 
what that means is as uh, Siobhan was referencing earlier is that using the edge person orchid attribute as an identifier when you are working on various projects it means that as a researcher if you move from one university to another university or one organization to another organization even though your username and password may change if access to that particular research resource is based on the edge person orchid attribute it would just be seamless. So even if you change organizations, you'll still have access to it. And then what we also need to do is we need to get services and infrastructure providers to use the ORCID attribute from the Federation. So it's not just organizations doing the ORCID integrations and exposing it to the Federation, but we also need to get services uh, using this particular attribute. Now, why would you want to do this, right? Most importantly, you want to do it for transparency. You want to make sure that uh, access to particular research resources is authenticated. There is a high level of assurance associated with it. And more importantly is you want to be able to disambiguate between researchers who are accessing those resources, right? Uh, you want to also look at it to see who is accessed what service so that you can then establish research provenance you can look at reproducibility and the confidence that then comes from this level of assurance means that uh, researchers will get acknowledged for their for their contributions to the scholarly body of knowledge next thing is comprehensiveness right uh, there is a lot of information about researchers who've received grants, who've used research facilities, written publications, and are employed by organizations. All this information is present, but might not necessarily be interconnected. Having seamless access and using the same username and password across all services across the board and using persistent identifiers like ORCIDs, or DOIs, what it does is it allows for interconnectivity between various entities like your research organizations, between infrastructure providers, as well as funding agencies and publishers. Then everybody's favorite is reporting, right? However, to be able to confidently report on uh, on usage or on anything, what you need to do is you need to be able to trust the data that you have and data that comes from sources of truth. For example, if it's an organization that employs a researcher, having that affiliation information asserted by the organization is important. You can be fairly confident that it is the right information, right? Uh, another things that you can, another sort of things that you can report on is the proportion of research conducted by Australian researchers. You can look at how much research has been conducted by international researchers. There's also uh, a possibility of looking at how much research that was done is rated at world-class or above, and how much of that actually use Australian research infrastructures. And you can even look at collaborations between different organizations. Right now, this over here, what you see is an example of uh, a collaboration network that I did with uh, Amir on uh, looking at the amount of collaborations that various countries and organizations did with regards to COVID-19. And what this shows is that we found out that by December 2020, 40, around 47,000 organizations were collaborating with each other. If we look, when we looked at December 2009, it was 1,500, and December 2019, that was about 3,000 uh, odd organizations that were collaborating. So what you can see is that you can, uh, this was possible only because uh, there were ORCID IDs, there were DOIs associated with each other. Uh, they were all linked together, which then allowed us to infer collaborations between different organizations. Now, uh, 
Any questions? Great, thank you, Melroy. <clears throat> there were some questions there in the chat. Um, can you see the chat, Melroy? Because uh, yes, I, I can to... see them now. Okay, great. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. We're starting from kind of a research work done in a private Australian organisation doing a research project that is registered with Oz Industry, can have access to AAF access IDs or get an ORCID ID, or is it only for universities? Oh, uh, it is open for any, it's open to any organisation. So at the AAF, we've got subscribers that are part of the uh, Australian research sector that are part of the government and even uh, independent organizations. So uh, even commercial organizations, so they don't have to be only related to, uh, they don't have to only be a university. It could be any of those organizations and that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, they should be able to uh, use it. What we get them to do is, organizations that have a single username and password or use the institutional username and password if they want to access multiple services they can join the AAF and we can help facilitate 